Sebastián de Banalcázar was born in Spain. And like many of his time and place, so we're talking the Iberian Peninsula in the 1500s, he decided that he might you know, seek his fortune elsewhere, in particular in the New World, in the Americas. And so he did. He crossed the ocean. He crossed the Atlantic. He spent some time in Panama. He assisted with the Spanish conquest of Nicaragua. But it was in 1531 that he joined that most historically significant expedition, namely the Pizarro expedition. See, an old conquistador named Francisco Pizarro, he'd been to the Incan Empire before. He knew there were great riches in gold and silver there, and he wanted to experience what Hernando Cortes had experienced against the Aztecs in Mexico just a few decades before. Cortes was a celebrity in Spain. Francisco Pizarro and every other conquistador wanted to be him. And so, Benalcazar joined Pizarro's expedition. And Pizarro set him up in charge of some of his northern forces. Now, Pizarro, he didn't have, you know, tons of troops or anything, but a handful of forces were put under Benalcazar's command. And Benalcazar was sent to what we would call Northwest Peru. And his mission was threefold. First, he was to guard a treasure, just a small treasure that was being sent and packed off to a this northwestern Peruvian port. He was to protect it and guard it on its way. Second, he was to wait there for orders from Pizarro to begin the conquest of the north, of the northern Incan Empire. All of this behind me would have been part of the northern, the far northern Incan Empire during Ben Alcazar's time. So he's to wait for those orders. And third, and perhaps most importantly, he was to find the location of a hidden treasure. There was a, a treasure rumored to exist, massive amounts of Inca gold and silver that had been purposefully hidden from the Spanish somewhere here in the northern part of the Incan Empire. Now the far northern part of the Inca Empire, essentially what we call Ecuador today, had only been conquered by the Inca themselves a few decades previously, and it had been done in very bloody fashion. The area was ravaged. The Incas carried out their own massacres and their own genocide in the area, including right here at this lake, but that's another story. Well, now fast forward to the time when the Spanish are arriving, the area is already being ravaged again by an Inca civil war, the war of the two brothers, not to mention being decimated by the plague, which has swept through the whole Inca empire. So this is the situation when the Spanish show up. Now, just because the area has been ravaged again and again, doesn't mean that Ecuador is going to be an easy conquest for Ben Alcazar. Uh, the area is, after all, guarded by, among others, the very talented Inca general, Rumin Yawi, and his army. Now, Rumin Yawi, meaning rock face or rock eye, was probably Atahualpa's half-brother born of Huayna Capac, the great Inca conqueror. And like Atahualpa, Ruminyawi was from the north. In his case, he's from Quito. When the Spanish held Atahualpa hostage, demanding rooms full of precious Inca gold and silver, Ruminyawi had marched from the north south with a treasure trove of gold and silver, hoping that it would satiate the foreigners. Of course, the, the Spanish got their gold and silver, they got their rooms full, from elsewhere in the empire, Ruminyawi's gold never reached Atahualpa. And when news reached Ruminyawi that Atahualpa had been killed anyway, he quickly turned around and marched north with his treasure here to make his stand. Incidentally, all that northern gold and silver that never made it in time to save Atahualpa's life was secreted away. It was hidden, concealed by Ruminyawi somewhere in the mountains of Ecuador probably central Ecuador, around the Chimborazo area, maybe. Who knows? It's never been found. It's still there, apparently, waiting to be discovered. This was the treasure that Benalcazar was supposed to find in the north. But Sebastián de Benalcazar was not alone. Not only had scores of other Spanish treasure seekers shown up on the shores of Ecuador, seeking to join Benalcazar's force as it attempted to conquer Quito, but an entirely separate Spanish army had shown up, not connected to Pizarro's crew at all. In fact, led by one of Pizarro's competitors, a guy named Pedro de Alvarado, the great conquistador of Guatemala and El Salvador, and the veteran of Cortez's conquest of Mexico. He showed up with his own army. Alvarado had heard of the great treasures of Peru, 
But when he got to Ecuador, of course, he found out that Banal Khazar had beat him to the punch. It almost devolved to bloodshed, actually. See, Banal Khazar, he's waiting for Pizarro's word, his orders, and they still hadn't come. And he has no idea of the fate of Pizarro far to the south. But when he finds out that Alvarado is there, he decides now is the time to move, and so he does. And it almost devolved to bloodshed, two Spanish armies fighting each other in South America. But in the end, and after a long and harrowing, really horrific march on Alvarado's part, high altitude march, in which many men were lost, finally Alvarado traded most of his army and his ships in exchange for a payoff and left Ecuador. Now the first time the forces of Ruminyawi ran into Banal Khazar and his forces was right here in southern Ecuador. It was just sort of by accident and it could have ended everything because Banal Khazar was separated from the main Spanish force. He was scouting ahead with just a handful of his men when one of Ruminyawi's lieutenants and a small army stumbled upon him. But the Spaniards had their horses and to the Incas these were strange new alien beasts. They must have appeared like dragons or something and the Incas got spooked and they ran. In April 1534 Banal Khazar reached the Cañari capital, at least former Cañari capital, of Tomepamba. Now this was an Inca capital, a, a, sort of the, the northern capital, an alternate capital of the Inca Empire. Now this whole area, you know, quite a vast area, southern Ecuador, not including the, the far western coastal plains, had all been Cañari territory at one point, but the Incas had conquered them uh, with much blood and, you know, broken promises and, and, and other things but quite a bit of domination, Inca domination on the locals, imposing their culture, imposing their language, imposing their religion. So there was a lot of Cañari bitterness against the Incas. And that's why the Spanish found in the Cañari willing allies, willing anti-Inca allies. And all that bitterness had been cultivated by occupation. This is the problem with empire. Empire and conquest breeds bitterness, and bitterness comes back to bite. The next month, May, Ruminyawi attacked the Banal Khazar with 50,000 Inca troops. 50,000! Keep in mind that Banal Khazar had something like 200 Spaniards, many of them with horses, but some of them without, and maybe 2,000 Cañari allies. This was the Battle of Teocajas, a high-altitude pitched battle between these two forces. Despite their numerical inferiority, the Spaniards and the Cañari actually held their own quite well, thanks in large part to the Spaniards' horses. The cavalry would cut deep into Inca ranks. And just to give you an idea of how the Incas viewed these strange creatures, when they did manage to kill one, and probably half a dozen of the horses died during the Battle of Teocajas, when the Incas did manage to kill one, they would cut off its head and then later stick it on a stick and parade it through surrounding villages, sort of like a victory parade, as if they'd slain a dragon or something. So they very much feared these horses which seemed to give the Spanish a little bit of a military edge. Well, no one, no one side won the Battle of Teocajas, which, by the way, was the largest pitched battle of the entire Spanish conquest of the Inca Empire, the Battle of Teocajas. And Banal Khazar was able to escape. He's mostly surrounded by Rumiñawi's troops, but a local guide helps him escape, and he presses on. On the road to Quito, Banal Khazar and his men were harassed pretty much the entire time, either by guerrilla-style partisans or in pitched battles with Inca troops. Now, Ruminyawi, you know, trying to deal with the horse problem, he pitted the road so that the horses would have trouble proceeding. He dug ditches and filled them with spikes, hoping the horses would impale themselves. But the Spanish never really fell for it. Crisscrossing in and out of the Andes over hundreds and hundreds of miles, Benalcazar and his men made their way to Quito and finally reached the city but Quito was not the gleaming city that they were hoping for. Instead, he found that much of the city had been burned to the ground and its treasure removed. Ruminyawi somehow had outflanked the Spanish and arrived about a week earlier. Ruminyawi attacked at night. 15,000 Inca troops descended on Quito, setting fire to more dwellings in the city and then engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with the Spanish and their Cañari allies. This was fierce, fierce fighting. But by the morning, once again, it was Spanish cavalry that spelled the difference between victory and defeat. The Spanish cavalry able to pursue the fleeing Inca troops all the way to Ruminyawi's camp. Now, Ruminyawi escaped 
but in the camp, the Spanish able to recover some gold, some silver, some women. And after this Inca loss, you see various chiefs in the area willingly submitting to the Spanish. But there was still the matter of all that great northern treasure. I mean, where was it? Banal Khazar decided he'd look north of Quito, here, in this area. And he became so frustrated that he couldn't find it, that no one would tell him where it was, that apparently he committed a great atrocity here. This is the village of Quinche, and all of its men were off fighting in the Inca army. And so Banal Khazar, out of frustration probably, and certainly at least officially the reason was he wanted to make an example of the people here, he gathered all the women and children of Quinche together and slaughtered them all. Another of the great Inca generals, his name was Quisquis, marched north a thousand miles to Quito to face Banal Khazar, and face him he did. But Banal Khazar prevailed. Now this defeat at the hands of the Spanish was a huge blow, I mean, psychologically demoralizing for the troops of Quisquis, who's, who, who've just marched so far only to be beaten, not to mention that they've been away from their families for years at this point. And so some of them, including some of Quisquis' own commanders, tried to convince him to surrender to the invincible Spanish. But he refused. He would not do it. He was a very proud guy, apparently. And unfortunately for him, this led to a mutiny. The mighty Quisquis was stabbed and clubbed to death. Well, at this point, most of the Incas have surrendered to the Spanish, but not Ruminyahui. He has escaped. And so Banal Khazar is forced to send his men out to find him. And eventually they do track him down high up in the mountains and drag him back to Quito. In Quito, a great torture session is underway. All the great Inca notables are being tortured, usually by fire, as Banal Khazar is trying to squeeze out of them the location of that dang treasure. But none of them know where it is. So they're going to end up dead. As for Ruminyawi, he is ultimately dragged out in chains to the great square in Quito, right there in central Quito, and officially executed for the crime of resisting the Spanish incursion. And with his death, we see the last of the great Inca generals gone. Now what followed was essentially a mop-up job. Sebastian de Banal Cazar had conquered Ecuador. He conquered the northern Inca empire. Now his resume would include other things. We've mentioned Panama, we've mentioned uh, Nicaragua. He'd go on to defeat the Muisca. He'd go on to found what is today Ecuador's largest city, Guayaquil. He'd go on to lead an expedition for El Dorado, the city of gold or the golden king. He'd found Popaya and Cali up in Colombia. He'd serve as a governor up there. But it was the conquest of Ecuador, the conquest of that great northern bastion of the Inca Empire, that likely trumps them all in terms of historical significance.